After my last video, several of my friends from the astronomy club seemed to take it upon themselves to convince me that imaging with an apochromatic refractor is worth the investment. Now, I have always been a proponent of going with the most budget-friendly approach when it comes to astronomy, which is why I've always been a big fan of the Dobsonian telescope, and it's why I've spent years imaging with a variety of camera lenses. Truth is, I've been thinking of upgrading for a while, so when a friend offered me a great deal on his Explorer Scientific ED80, I decided to take the challenge and see for myself if upgrading was really worth the investment. In this video, you're going to be taking part in my imaging session tonight. We're going to be photographing a couple of different target types, and you're going to see for yourself how this little scope performs in the city. Now, I've got some helpful techniques and tricks to share with you that I use when photographing the night sky. For those of you thinking of upgrading to your first epichromatic refractor, or for those of you interested in just learning more about this amazing hobby, well then I hope this video helps you. Let's get started. I live just a few miles from downtown Sacramento, California state capital. Like any major city, we have our share of light pollution. Here's a photo I took from about 10 miles outside of town. You can see how all the light pollution from Sacramento is reflecting off of all that smog, or as I call it, the Sacramento Nebula. Here's a photo I took from my backyard just this last summer. It's completely washed out, and the Milky Way is just barely visible over to the left. Tonight, we'll see how this light pollution impacts imaging. We actually have four targets for tonight. The first two targets are Messier objects 42 and 43, the Great Orion Nebula, and the Running Man Nebula. Now these targets are located in the constellation Orion, which is to the south of us and will be passing right over the top of this fence. As seen in this tracked five minute exposure, I took from my Astronomy Club's Dark Sky site. This is a very well-known and prominent constellation in the winter and spring evening skies. This emission reflection nebula is located approximately 1300 light years from Earth and can be observed in Orion's sword, which is located just below Orion's belt. By comparison, in this 17 second exposure from my backyard, this constellation is still very easy to locate, even under light polluted skies. Now Orion is currently passing directly over the light dome given off by the city of Sacramento. And as bright as this target is, photographing it through this amount of light pollution is going to be a big challenge. The third and fourth targets for tonight are Messier objects 81 and 82, the Bode and Cigar galaxies. Now these two targets are gonna be rising in the Northeast along with Ursa Major. This interacting starburst galaxy pair is located approximately 12 million light years from Earth. Now, because of their close proximity and their high surface brightness, this is a very popular target for astrophotographers. As you can see, I already have my scope set up on my equatorial mount. And before the sun goes down, I wanna share a time-saving tip. Get everything you can done while the sun is still up. Set up all of your equipment, get everything level, and if you know where your target's gonna appear, properly balance everything and do your polar alignment ahead of time. Wait, did I say polar align? I mean, the sun's still up. We can't even see Polaris yet. How are we supposed to do that? Well, I've actually already done a rough polar alignment. Let me show you something. Do you see this bolt and washer in the lawn? Well, that's there for a very good reason. If I center my equatorial mount directly over this point, Polaris will be centered directly over the roof. Come here, take a look. Having this figured out is a major time saver since it allows me to get all of my setup, leveling, and get that rough alignment done before the sun even goes down. Now once the sun's down, we just need to make a few adjustments and we're good to go. Now you don't need to use the top of a house, but really anything can work, even a tall tree or a power pole. Now one note about using a technique like this is that if you want to set up during the day to track and photograph an eclipse, or maybe to photograph one of those planet or international space station transits, a rough alignment like this is really all you're going to need. Now we're going to need to fine tune this alignment once the sun goes down, but for now, we're set. All of our targets for tonight are either going to be at the meridian, which is that invisible line running north to south at 90 degrees above your head, or they're going to be to the west of the meridian. So with that in mind, we're going to want to position our camera and scope on the east side of the mountain. Now this is important for one very specific reason. 
If the camera and scope are on the west side of the mount, while you're imaging the west side of the sky, it's going to eventually run into your tripod. Now when it comes to balancing, I use a technique which is referred to as balancing east heavy. Now this is just a fancy way of saying anything to the east of the equatorial axis should be slightly heavier than to the west of it. Now usually just a few ounces is enough, and I can get into the mechanics of why that works at a later date. But for now, we've saved time by getting all of this done ahead of time, and we're properly balanced to photograph the west side of the sky. Now a couple notes about what's behind me. There's a tree and a pole. Orion is going to be to the west of the pole, so that's not going to interfere at all. Now the sun's going to go down in a couple more hours, and the moon should set by about 8 o'clock. I can't wait. Well, the forecast was right. The sky is perfectly clear. Now, I've done a few things since the sun's gone down. I've fine-tuned that rough alignment from earlier. I focused the scope with my Batonoff mask on Capella, and as you can see, I'm currently aimed at Orion. Now, if you remember from my first video, this mount is tracking only, which means there's no go-to system. So to find my targets, I still use a technique which is referred to as star hopping. And to do that, I use a combination of my pocket sky atlas, and now, my right angle and red dot finder. Now if you've learned the night sky with a manual Dobsonian like I did, then it's actually really easy to locate your target with this setup. For Orion, I'm going to be taking 120 light frames at 60 seconds each at ISO 800. Now I have all the settings programmed in the camera, let me show you what they are. I'm using ISO 800 for the shot for several different reasons. The scope has a focal ratio of f6. And since Orion's so bright, I really don't want to blow out the detail around the trapezium, which is that bright open cluster of stars at the center of the nebula. Photographing through the city light dome must be considered, but also of equal importance is the fact that a lower ISO will result in less noise in the final stacked image. Well, it looks like we're all ready to take that first test shot, so let's turn off this light and I'll do that now. Well, the first test frame is done. Let's take a look at what we got. Well, as you can see, the light pollution is playing a big part in this image, and I'll need to recenter before I start. But at a 480 millimeter focal length, I can easily fit Orion's sword in the frame. For a single frame with this much light pollution, it's actually really nice. And if you look close, you can actually see both of the nebulae and the scope's picking up quite a bit of color. Now I'm not using a light pollution filter, and that's clearly impacting imaging, but still really nice. But you can probably see why I typically limit my light frames to 60 seconds each from my backyard. Well, I've centered Orion better in the scope, so it looks like we're all ready. Let me turn off this light and we'll start imaging. And away we go. Well, since this is one of the rare clear nights we've had this spring, I've got my Dobsonian set up and I'm gonna make the most of it. Now I've actually got M45, the Pleiades star cluster in the eyepiece. And you know what? Let's try something a little bit different. Let's see if you can see in the eyepiece what I can see. Now, I don't know if this is gonna show up, but I'll put it in the video if it does. Now let me see if I can get this centered. There you go. Look at that, guys. That's the Pleiades star cluster as seen through an 8 inch Dobsonian with a 40 millimeter 2 inch eyepiece. That's pretty amazing, and I can't believe that worked. Honestly, it's probably just because M45 is so bright. I don't think this would work on a fainter object. Well, it's been two and a half hours, and Orion is getting really low on the horizon. We've already gathered all of our light frames. And I've also gathered all my dark, flat, and bias calibration frames. If you would like to see how those are taken, I can cover that in a future video. Right now, we've got to move the scope to photograph M81 and M82. So I'm going to do that now. Well, it looks like we're getting a few clouds in, but that's okay. They're just staying over on that horizon over there. Now, if you remember from earlier in my video, M81 and M82 are almost at the meridian, and during this imaging session, they're actually going to be moving to the west of it. 
So I'm going to keep my camera and scope on the east side of the mount. Now before we start imaging, let me show you something. I've positioned the camera at this angle so that M81 is going to be on the left and M82 is on the right. If the camera were positioned like this, then M81 would actually be positioned above M82. Now where these two galaxies are in the photo is just a personal preference, of course. I like to plan these shots out in that way, since it really helps to make the most out of that area of sky that you're imaging. You know, this is especially important when you're photographing those larger nebulae or a large galaxy like Andromeda. I'm going to be taking 120 light frames at 60 seconds each at ISO 1600. Now I'm using a higher ISO value for this target for a couple different reasons. One, it's much fainter than Orion, so we're going to need to gather more light. But two, there's also less light pollution in the northern part of the sky, so we can get away with this. Now it looks like we're all ready. I'm going to turn off this light and we're going to take that shot. Our first test frame is done. Let's take a look at what we got. Okay, so at this focal length, the galaxies are actually really, really small on the screen. Let me zoom in. All right, there we go. Let's take a look. The first thing you'll notice is that the light pollution is not as bad in this region of the sky. And look, you can actually see some of the structure in both galaxies. You can clearly see some of the spiral in M81, and I can even detect some faint color in M82. Okay, so it looks like we're all ready to go. I'm gonna turn off this light and we're gonna take those light frames. Well, it's two in the morning and we're all done gathering our light frames. Now the temperature dropped another 12 degrees, so we had to gather additional dark calibration frames. Now I still gotta to go to work in the morning and it's gonna take me a couple of evenings to stack and process all these images. So I'm gonna put away all my gear and I'm gonna to go to bed. Well, stacking and post-processing is all done. And as I expected, light pollution was the biggest issue that I had with what came out of Deep Sky Stacker. In fact, most of my time post-processing was just dealing with that one issue while trying to maintain as much color and detail as I could in the final image. Now, I wanna save the best for last, so let's start with M81 and M82, the Bode and Cigar galaxies. I'm really happy with the amount of detail shown in this image, especially that of M81. I mean, look at the amount of spiral structure shown. It's really amazing. Considering the equipment that I use, the exposure length of those light frames, the total integration time, and the amount of light pollution here in the backyard, I think it actually came out really nice. Now let's take a look at my favorite image, the Great Orion Nebula and the Running Man Nebula. This image blew my socks off when it first came out of Deep Sky Stacker. The initial tone curve adjustment showed more detail than I ever could have hoped for with the camera lenses I've used. I mean, look at the detail in the nebulosity. It's absolutely breathtaking. Considering the amount of light pollution I was photographing through and had to correct for, I'm actually really impressed at the amount of detail and color I was able to maintain. Honestly, this is probably the best photo I've ever taken from my backyard. The cost of the ED80 Plus Field Flattener is definitely not trivial, but is it worth it? Well, while the pictures we took are really amazing, it really comes down to what you can afford and your own personal goals of how you want to invest your time photographing the night sky. You know, if you're just starting out and you're not sure if astrophotography is for you, then I would always advise starting with something simple like a camera lens and a basic tracking mount. However, if you want something better than that, then you do have a lot of options. Many people use and prefer reflectors since you can get a larger aperture for the price. I personally really like this ED80. It's just, it's something about the portability of it that just makes me happy. And it takes very nice photos. I think that's really a matter of personal taste though. Because, okay, so I'm not gonna call the winner or loser in that reflector versus refractor competition. Because honestly, whether you're using a reflector, a refractor, or a basic camera lens like I started out with, 
if you're getting out under the stars and learning, well, the only winner in that competition is going to be you. Well, that's all for now. I actually have a lot of plans for future videos, so if you'd like to see more, please click like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.